our favourite speakers back, Mark White, who is Professor of History at London University. And Mark has been a supporter of the library right from the beginning. Uh, those of you who come to the library will recognise him. He's often there. Um, it's hard to miss because he's about nine foot tall. Um, and he's talked to us before about Kennedy um, and the Cuban Missile Crisis and also one of his pet subjects, Kenneth Branagh. Um, Mark is um, a specialist in American history and within that, a specialist on presidents. So um, we thought, given that, this is a rather timely talk. And by the way, after this talk, there is a program on television about Trump, which will probably say the reverse of everything we discussed today. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, U3A uh, London, who've been a loyal supporter every year and allow us to have our video DVDs free and also support these talks. And Osborne's Law, who've been a terrific supporter of the library and a number of other local activities, again, for quite a while. And they're always there for us when we need them. Without people like that, we couldn't manage. Uh, the library is still open two days a week. And we, although we've now moved into alert stage two, uh, we are continuing to open the library and we'll do so. Uh, if we move into alert stage three, we will be rethinking that. But for the moment, we carry on. And we had a long discussion today with the City of London experts, and that's how it is. Uh, and a last thank you before I hand over to Mark, uh, to Jason Ball, who kindly uh, made the technology available to us this evening and is always there to help us when we uh, can't remember what button to press. So thank you very much, Jason, much appreciated. And with that, over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as Stephen said, I do make use of the, of the library. Uh, am I coming across? Can you, is the sound fine, everything? It is, it is for me. I can't, uh, the others uh, are silenced, so yeah. Okay, that's great. If anybody, um, can't, if anybody can't hear, then send me a message uh, or put your hand up if you know how to do that on the screen. We'll see what we can do. So, um, yeah, I am delighted to be here. Um, I, I think sustaining the library in the last decade has been nothing less than a major cultural achievement. I can't think of Hampstead uh, without it. And public libraries have always been really important to me. Um, my childhood where I grew up in East Yorkshire, the, my school was two years from, two, two miles from my house. And the public library was smack in the middle, about a mile away. And I just got in the habit after school of, of rather than going straight home, going to the public library and just remember it closed at seven o'clock. So I'd work from sort of 4.30 till seven. It's been extremely important to me in my intellectual journey, such as it is. So I'm delighted to be speaking to you tonight um, about, a very topical subject, which is Donald Trump, his presidency, and the 2020 presidential campaign. Um, I think I should preface my remarks by making clear that um, I probably never wanted a candidate to lose as much as I want Trump to uh, lose this election. Um, I've been concerned by, in particular, his attacks on the judiciary, his attacks on a free press, and those are bedrocks of any democracy. Um, and so th those, those things, amongst other things, have, have concerned me. But what I want to do tonight is to put Trump in some sort of historical context. I was talking to Stephen before about what I could do with, uh, on this occasion, and we were both agreeing that what might be useful, uh, because we've heard so much about Trump and, you know, people in the fourth estate making very perceptive comments about him. But what I could perhaps usefully do, given my background, is to put him in some sort of historical context, to try and understand him in the context of modern American political history. So what I'm gonna do this evening is to compartmentalize my talk into three, three different sections. Firstly, 
I want to talk about Trump's rise to power. Um, how do we account for that? What underlying factors um, explain that? So that's the first thing I want to talk about. Then secondly, I'm going to look at the Trump presidency itself. And in particular, I want to consider this question, which I think is going to be centrally important to historians of future years, which is, to what extent is he uh, unique? To what extent is he unlike any other president in American history? Or are there, in fact, parallels uh, certain parallels between Trump's presidency and previous occupants of the White House? And then thirdly and finally, I want to get to the 2020 election itself and to consider the factors which, which, which will determine the outcome of the election. So let me start with the first of those three things then, which is to talk about Trump's rise to power. How do we explain it? Um, beyond the policy positions uh, he took, which, um, and, and, you know, his sort of abilities as a, as a demagogue, uh, and so on. What underlying factors explain his rise to power? I think there are a number. One is the rise of celebrity in American politics. Now, with Trump, um, of course, he has a background as a businessman, uh, as someone who built a property empire in New York City, well, inherited it from his father and developed it further. But most Americans know him as a TV host. That's what, how most Americans know him, as a TV celebrity uh, on the show The Apprentice, uh, in which he was able to portray himself as this big city property magnate. And that was important in terms of turning around his sort of credibility. He, I mean, to some extent, at the turn of the millennium, he was a figure of mirth. But there are accounts of how once that show started, he, he noticed how people uh, were more respectful to him when he bumped into them on the street. So that is how most Americans know Trump, as a television celebrity. And in a sense, that is the culmination of a longer term development in American politics. Um, I mean, politics, or at least for the politicians who do it well, involves some, or necessitates some kind of skill in the performance arts. Um, and I mean, if you go back to someone like Franklin Roosevelt, he was very aware of that when he met with Orson Welles, he said to Orson Welles, you know, you and I are the two best actors in the country. Um, if you look at someone like Kennedy, his, uh, John Kennedy, his father had been, uh, I mean, he basically made a fortune on the unregulated stock market of the 1920s, but he was also a Hollywood producer. And JFK spent a lot of time in Hollywood. And there was an account of him as a young man during World War II before he's entered politics. Um, visiting a friend called Charles Spaulding and, 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 and talking with him at great length, what is it about Gary Cooper, the way he enters the room? How does he grab that attention? How does he make such an impression? Thinking about how the skills of Hollywood actors could be deployed in politics. And then, and then of course, you have the election in 1980 of Ronald Reagan as president, two-term president, um, who had been a professional Hollywood actor. Uh, that is what he was doing in the 1940s, uh, 1930s, 1940s. And, you know, his support is called on the great communicator in terms, of his, in terms of his communicative skills. And of course, that is what his training was. He knew how to, to read his lines and to deliver a speech fluently and persuasively. Uh, if you look at Bill Clinton, when he was, he was elected in 1992, he spent a lot of time before his election as president courting Hollywood, spending time there, uh, getting big donations from people in Hollywood, Barbara Streisand and others. So, and then of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's a massive movie star in the 1980s, and um, ends up as governor of California, one of the biggest economies in the world, uh, one of the most politically important states in the union, uh, obviously. So in a sense, Trump's election, someone who'd been a TV star, was the culmination of that development of an ever increasing emphasis on celebrity in American politics. I think that's one way in which you can understand how the election of Trump took place. Um, and I'll just add this before I move on. There was a guy who predicted this, which is a really interesting uh, bloke called George Ball, who was a State Department official in the 1960s, and was kind of a hero to many people later because he was the one official 
in the administration of Lyndon, Johnson, uh, of Lyndon Johnson, who told Johnson not to go to war in Vietnam. He said to him, it's going to be a disaster, you'll lose, it will divide the nation and it will destroy your presidency. He, he was right on all counts. And circa 1960, he predicted this. He said, this is the way politics is going. There's an ever greater emphasis on the televisual, how you come across on television. And in the end, actors are going to be the people elected to high office. So the election of Trump is, is a culmination of that development, of an ever greater emphasis on celebrity in American politics. The second way in which I think you can understand how Trump became president is, and I think this is a really important point, is to consider the impact of globalization on uh, US politics, and particularly on the attitudes of the working class. The, um, so obviously globalization has been a phenomenon of the last few, few decades in terms of politics and economics. Uh, Bill Clinton, when he was president in the 1990s, uh, negotiated all sorts of free trade uh, agreements. And um, what's really, really interesting, if you look at the polling data, is, I mean, I used to assume that the kind of backlash against globalisation, which in a way you can see with Brexit in this country, and um, the election of, uh, uh, with Brexit in this country, the election of, of Trump in 2016, is, um, it, so, you know, you, 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 know you, you, you know this has happened. I, I always thought it was a response to the 2008 crash. That's why I used to think, I, I thought this is a response to the 2008 financial crash. Uh, but if you look at the polling data, it goes back to the mid 1990s, whereby a lot of people at the grassroots um, came to dislike and oppose globalization and particularly the traditional working, working class. And up until the mid 1990s, most of the people at the grassroots were more in favor of globalization than political elites. But what's happened over the last quarter century now is this huge gap has developed between what uh, the political elites think and what people at the grassroots think. Um, and basically what you know, the working class, and you could see this in the Rust Belt swing states in the Midwest felt, was that high quality blue collar jobs have been lost as a, as a result of globalization. That high quality blue collar jobs have gone to where labor costs are cheap and therefore the, the working class has, uh, has, has lost out. So the working class feels that it has been marginalized economically, also in a sense marginalized politically, because in the 1990s, the, the basic strategic decision the Democratic Party made during the presidency of Bill Clinton was to pivot to the center. Don't worry about the traditional working class, they've got nowhere else to go, that uh, no one else to vote for. Concentrate on the suburban middle class, the swing voters, that's how we're gonna win elections. Remember by the early 1990s, the Democrats had lost five out of six presidential elections. Um, so in a sense, they were abandoned politically and also in terms of discourse, um, you know, lots of other issues emerged, which were very important. The environment, which obviously has a transcendent importance, identity politics, which is important because it relates to social justice, but, but, but justice, but there was ever, an ever decreasing amount of emphasis, focus in the political discourse on the working class. They got forgotten about. Um, and you know, of course, they didn't respond uh, in a tranquil way. What, what we know now is that there was feelings of, of rage and impotence. And what's really interesting are the, the medical implications of this. A couple of Princeton economists did work on this, and they showed that how basically sort of the lifespans of uh, you know um, that constituency had gone up over a century, but people, but it was now actually uh, receding. People were living less long. Uh, and the, uh, amongst this, this constitu constituency, uh, they were killing themselves with alcohol, uh, uh, drug abuse, suicide. So a real sense of desperation. And um, with Trump, whatever you think about him, understood that, understood the kind of um, anger because of all of that in traditional working class constituencies. And uh, more so than Hillary Clinton, because remember infamously, during, during the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton referred to those sorts of Trump supporters as deplorables. What's really interesting is that it is evidence that behind closed doors during the, uh, Clinton's campaign, that Bill Clinton said to her, she made the decision in the end, well, I'm just not gonna worry about those voters. I'm just gonna worry about you know, the middle class, 
uh, and other traditional democratic constituencies. I'm not going to worry about uh, those sorts of working class voters. And Bill Clinton said to her, apparently, behind closed doors, you can't do that. You can't do it politically, you can't neglect them, and you can't do it morally. Um, so I think the most, to me, the most incredible statistic that comes out of the 2016 election is if you look at the 600, if you look at the 660 poor counties in America where the average income is below the national median and the population is 85% white or more, do you know how many of those 660 counties Hillary Clinton carried in 2016? Two. Um, Bill Clinton, by, by contrast, who had a very progressive agenda on race, carried hundreds, half of them. So that is the other way in which, uh, and I think that is the connection between the election of Trump and Brexit, is the, is, is the marginalisation of the working class, the, the, the way they, they feel that they've been forgotten about, marginalised economically. And so the election of Trump can be viewed in that sense as a, as a reaction against globalization. So that's another key factor. I think a third way in which you can understand the election of Trump in accounting for you know, why it happened is to, is to do with the impact of technology on politics and how changes in technology affect politics. Now, politics has often changed as a result of this. So for example, with radio in the 1920s and 1930s, commercial radio came to America in the 1920s. Um, by the early 20s, you had 500 commercial radio stations and it affects politics. By 1928, presidential candidates are campaigning using radio. And of course, it is central to Franklin Roosevelt's communicative strategy during the Great Depression, the New Deal years. He was a brilliant communicator. I mean, for my money, the best, the greatest orator in 20th century American uh, you know, presidential history. And he used those communicative skills to communicate to the American people via radio. These were called his fireside chats, where, he, where Americans would sit down in the living room and listen to him, and it, was, it felt very personal. And that changes politics. And the same thing happens with the election of John Kennedy with television. Television came to America in the 1950s. Only 10% of Americans had TV in 1950, about 90% by 1960. That changes politics. It's the first year, 1960, when there were televised presidential debates four between Kennedy and Nixon, but it was the first one that really made a difference and that most Americans watched. And I mean, famously with that debate, um, the overwhelming majority of people who watched on television thought Kennedy annihilated Nixon. The people who listened on radio, which was significantly fewer, thought that it was a draw or possibly Nixon had won, which tells you everything about the power of the visual medium. I mean, this is an iconic part of American political folklore. Kennedy wore the right suit, a dark suit, which contrasted with the gray background. Nixon wore a gray suit, he kind of blended in. Nixon had been ill in the days before the, before the debate. So his, his, his jacket and shirt were, didn't fit well, they were loose. Kennedy's suit was crisply cut and perfect. Um, Kennedy wore the, the proper TV makeup. Nixon didn't, he wore something called lazy shave. So his, his face, face began to streak with sweat. And so the visuals were terrible. Kennedy was behind in that election before that first te television debate. After it, straight after it, he moved ahead and he stayed ahead for the rest of the campaign. And he won in the end of that incredibly narrow election, uh, very, very closely fought election. So you can definitely argue that television, the medium television, was, was crucial to Kennedy's victory. Um, with Trump, I think you can argue, along with FDR um, and Kennedy, Trump is the most consequential president uh, in American history in terms of communication strategy because of his use of social media and in particular Twitter. He started using Twitter in, I think it was 2009. At first he just used it occasionally, but then more and more and more as time would, time would go on. And it was a key part of his campaign. I mean, he, um, if you look at Trump on social media, he, he got a lot more retweets, uh, sharing than Hillary Clinton did. It was a, a key part of his communication strategy. And what he felt, yeah, and uh, what he felt was it allowed him to get his message out unfiltered by a, uh, unfiltered by a sens censorious uh, media. When he became president, when he was elected president, a lot of people said that they assumed that he would stop using Twitter because it seemed gauche, uh, yeah, unseemly, unpresidential. 
Um, and he you know, famously sent out a message tweeting saying, my use of Twitter isn't presidential, it's modern day presidential. He said to Michael Gove that he was going to keep doing it because he felt the press treated him so badly and this is the way of getting his message out. So um, technology has had an impact on politics and social media is a really important part of it. And again, you know, whatever you say about him, um, he's very adept at controlling the news cycle. If he wants to change the news, he just sends out a controversial tweet and all the um, television news stations uh, lead with it. So he can just change the news cycle like that, which is politically, um, you know, very useful indeed. Also, what conservatives in America have felt for a long time is that basically the traditional media is biased against conservative candidates. And what they think is that, I think Trump thinks it is that Trump's use of social media and Twitter has allowed them to correct that balance. That is what they feel. So um, in addition to Trump's particular uh, attributes as a polit politician, I think you can see his election in 2016 as the culmination of all those, uh, all those uh, um, you know, developments, the increasing celebrity that's evident in politics, and uh, the response to globalization uh, in, in working in working class uh, communities and the impact impact of technology on American politics. Okay, let's move on to the second thing I said I wanted to talk about, um, which is the Trump presidency itself, and to think about this issue of, you know, how unique is Trump in the context of modern American political history? It's so easy to think of him as unique, um, not necessarily in a positive way. He, because on, on the surface, he does seem so different from other, other presidents. Um, he says so many things that are outlandish, uh, bizarre, for instance, suggesting that Americans consider swallowing disinfectant as a, as a way to treat um, COVID. However, if you look at it more closely, it is more complex than that. So, for example, if you uh, look at the question of what his core uh, fiscal and defence policies are, what Trump has done has been to cut taxes. Um, he actually wanted, in 2016, he talked about cutting taxes for uh, ordinary middle class, working class Americans. I think that's what he wanted to do and his advisor, Steve Bannon, wanted him to do that. I think it would have been very interesting had he done that or been able to. But uh, in 2017, the first year of his presidency, he, was, he, he, he um, wanted to abolish Obamacare. Uh, he, he promised to do that. He was unable to, unable to do that. And so he felt he needed to get you know, a tax bill through Congress. He needed some signature major domestic policy achievement. The only way he could get it through Congress was by working with Congress. And in the end, he does a, um, get a tax bill through Congress, which cut taxes in particular for corporations uh, and also the rich also for poor americans but much less the tax cuts for corporations were permanent and large the, the tax cuts for poor americans were temporary and small but nevertheless tax cuts the other thing he wanted to do was uh, was to enact a large military build-up he proposed increasing defense spending by over 50 billion dollars a year in the end, Congress increased it even more than that. So by the end of the year, end of, end of his first year in the White House, he was able to, to sign a defense bill uh, for, uh, with, a, with a military budget of $700 billion, um, which he was very happy about that. Now, in a way, the fiscal implications of all of that were, were obvious, which is if you're going to cut taxes, so cut the revenue that the government receives and increase spending uh, on defense, you're going to get debt. And that is exactly what happened. By late 2019, so that's less than three years into his presidency, he had increased um, the national debt by $3 trillion. But that is hardly unique in American history. With George Bush Jr., we had the same recipe, tax cuts, military buildup, escalating debt. And then notably with Ronald Reagan, uh, generally considered by most the most con successful conservative president in the last half a century. Um, he carried out, <clears throat> carried out a huge military buildup um, to unprecedented levels in peacetime, a large tax cut, 
and massively increased the national debt. I mean, Reagan, Reagan in a sense did change the meaning of conservatism because for conservatives before then, uh, being responsible with the nation's treasure, trying to balance the budget was seen as a, you know, a, a moral as well as a, as well as a fiscal necessity. Dwight Eisenhower, the two term Republican president in the 50s would have turned in his grave uh, what, what Reagan did in the fiscal sense. But, it, uh, but again, tax cuts, military buildup and um, escalating debt. And it wasn't, uh, that approach wasn't just confined to Republican presidents because Kennedy, when he's president, carries out the biggest sort of little known fact about his presidency, the biggest peacetime incre increase in US military spending in history up to that point. And by the final year of his presidency, 62, 63, he champions a, a tax cut which passes after his assassination. So, you know, if you look at the core fiscal um, and defence policies that Trump carried out, that there, there was there's a very strong precedent for them in American president, American political history, modern political history. A lot of other presidents basically did the same thing. Um, how did he handle North Korea, the sort of relic of the Cold War, communist state, uh, harsh rhetoric, uh, increasing sanctions? He also negotiated at times, but basically a pretty hard line approach. Well, Ronald Reagan had done the same thing in relation to the to the to uh, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Kennedy had done the same thing with Fidel Castro in Cuba. So that was hardly unique. Um, in terms of his uh, image, I think if you look at his presidential image, one of the interesting things about him is the way in which he has used family in his administration. He was accused of nepotism when he appointed Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, to a senior foreign policy position, uh, the remit for which included dealing with China, uh, the Middle East and Mexico. And Ivanka, his daughter, he made uh, a an advisor to the president. And, you know, by 2017, she's sh sharing a stage with Angela, Angela Merkel. And we know from accounts uh, leaked that have come out in books and, and so on, that she's been talking privately about how she will be, how she plans to try and become the first female president in American history, uh, using the elevated status which her father's presidency has given her. So that seems um, a rather distinctive thing to do, to use family in such a brazen fashion. But again, um, what's the difference between that and Kennedy, who appoints his brother, Bobby Kennedy, Attorney General, which is a very important position in the cabinet, so head of the Justice Department, and his closest advisor. I mean, in truth be told, the second most powerful man in America. And then when he becomes president, he vacates his Senate seat. He gets a friend to, to occupy it briefly until his brother, Ted Kennedy, Edward Kennedy, is old enough to run for it, which he does in 62, and Ted Kennedy wins and takes his Senate seat. So again, uh, family is a central part of, Ken family is a major part of Tr Trump's image, the construction of his image. Uh, it was also a major part of Kennedy's as well. So again, not, uh, not unprecedented. In terms of his communication strategy, Trump's communication strategy of using social media, Twitter in particular, um, as a way of bypassing the, uh, the, the media, um, just going straight to the, the people themselves. That was, uh, again, something with precedent. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt felt he was doing the same thing with radio and John Kennedy as well. When John Kennedy became president, he makes the decision to do something which no previous president had, which was to hold live televised press conferences. Um, his press secretary, Pierre Salinger, could see how well he'd done in the television debates with Nixon and suggested the idea. Some of Kennedy's advisors were very concerned because they thought, well, what if, you know, this is live. What if, what if he, met, you know, makes a gaffe? It goes out before 50 million people. But Kennedy was, was confident individual and was confident that that, uh, that wouldn't happen. Um, and he definitely saw it as a way of just going, communicating directly to the American people and cutting out journalists. It's interesting, it's interesting. a lot of um, newspaper journalists were furious at Kennedy holding live televised press conferences because they understood it marginalized their importance. Kennedy wasn't dependent on them reporting in a, in a favorable way. There's an account of a conversation between Kennedy and a journalist friend of his, Ben, ben Bradley, in late 1962, December 1962, where Bradley says to him, you know, oh, that, that's, I saw, saw, saw what you did on television the other day. I thought it was really effective. And Kennedy said to him, yeah, 
I've always said when we don't have to go through you bastards, I can get my message out to the American people. It's probably exactly the sort of thing that Trump would say or think. So again, that commu basic communication strategy is with presidential precedent. Um, the, there's been a lot of work on the presidency in the last couple of decades on the issue of, uh, on the issue of character. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time here, on the issue of um, character. And uh, yeah, particularly on presidents who have sort of extraordinary personal lives. So there's a, an American historian called Thomas Reeves, uh, Wisconsin, who published a book in the early 1990s on JFK called A Question of Character. And he had a very negative view of the Kennedy presidency. And what he basically argued was, was that the foundation of exceptional leadership is character, he argued. And the problem with Kennedy, he said, was that basically he didn't have any in terms of not possessing a moral compass of not understanding the basic difference between right and wrong. And you could see this in his uh, in his private life. And you could and, and you could see this uh, in his presidency as well. And so there's a lot of interest in, you know, not just presidential policy, but presidential character. Uh, and Trump's character does seem, uh, I'm, I'm uh, no psychologist, but Trump's character does seem extraordinary. He certainly seems to be uh, evidently narcissistic. Um, I mean, do you remember the, uh, the press conference given by his, um, pugnacious press secretary Sean Spicer the day after his inauguration when Spicer passed on basically passed on from Trump how far more people had attended his inauguration than Barack Obama's that was demonstrably uh, demonstrably untrue and photographs uh, showed that but obviously Trump's ego required it not to be true um, but then you know I was thinking well is how unique is that in American history there's certainly been presidents before with huge egos and, and probably narcissistic as well. I was thinking in particular of Lyndon Johnson, who of course uh, um, went by the initials LBJ and was incredibly uh, narcissistic, narcissistic e egotistical. Um, his, his wife was known as Lady Bird Johnson, LBJ. His daughters, Lucy and Linda, I think were also LBJs. His dog was Little Beagle Johnson. He lived at the LBJ ranch. Plenty of signs of you know, narcissism there. So again, I wonder how unprecedented that is. In terms of Trump's private life, he's obviously a flounder of spectacular proportions. A lot of women came forward in the 2016 campaign, uh, making all sorts of uh, complaints, sort of sexual complaints about Trump's conduct towards them. Then a year into his presidency, also um, there were the scandals concerning Stormy Daniels, a porn star, who claimed he'd had sexual relations with her and so on. And then he paid her off, and also a Playboy model as well. But again, that, in terms of in terms of character and private life uh, and that sort of conduct behind closed doors uh, not only is that not unprecedented in, in the history of the modern history of the presidency it's it is banal in the literal sense of that word it's commonplace we know that warren harding president of the early 1920s uh, had affairs and uh, got a, a teenager pregnant she had the child and he, he sent a child support throughout his presidency Franklin Roosevelt, uh, before he'd been president, had, had an affair with a woman called Lucy Mercer, um, nearly destroyed his marriage. She comes back into his life right at the end of his presidency. And actually, when he dies in April 1945, he's with her. And Eleanor Roosevelt finds that out, sort of the ultimate betrayal. Um, John Kennedy had an you know, extraordinary um, a private life. Um, for example, and I could give many, uh, he had a, a relationship in the final year of his life and presidency with a woman called Ellen Romish, who was a prostitute. She was uh, from West Germany, well, actually originally from, originally from communist East Germany, then went to West Germany, and uh, Kennedy had a sexual relationship with her, as did future president Gerald Ford. So in terms of all of that, you know, um, it's, uh, it's hard, it's hardly without precedent in terms of the uh, in terms of the in terms of the American American presidency. So there's a lot about Trump which is not without precedent. He's not wholly unique. However, there are some um, major differences as well. And I think in terms of the modern presidency, particularly on the issue of race, um, he I think as one writer said, 
no president since the heyday of the civil rights movement of the 1960s has used such overtly racialized rhetoric. And what's interesting is Trump was actually popular with uh, my, uh, minor, Amer Americans from minority backgrounds because of The Apprentice. The Apprentice often showcased um, a contestants from minority backgrounds in a kind of upwardly mobile context. So he was actually popular. What changed it all was his involvement in, in, the, in the Bertha movement, which challenged the, le the legitimacy of Obama's presidency. He claimed that Obama uh, you know, ludicrous, ludicrously had not been born in America and therefore uh, shouldn't be president of the United States. And so that was an indication of a sort of change in tack uh, in Trump on the issue of race. And, you know, so many things have happened during his presidency where he's used language that's, that's insensitive, inappropriate. And I think the most egregious case was Charlottesville, Virginia. And it was August 2017, wasn't it, when there were clashes between Black Lives Matter protesters, protests, protesters on the one hand and... Uh, Clan and Nazi uh, people on the other, and Trump didn't draw a moral distinction between between them, and um, that was seen as shocking. I think Biden has said that was the moment when he realised he needed to run for presidency. That had been so shocking. So um, this kind of racialized racialized rhetoric he uses that is um, different from other recent presidents and. You know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I've, I'm interested in, and I've written on this whole issue of presidential character. And what I'm interested in is also is the, the link between character um, and policy. I mean, I actually think it's very, very difficult to extrapolate from presidents' sort of private lives and private character and the policies they carry out, because most policies are morally ambiguous. And the example I always give is military, is, is military spending during the Cold War. You know, you could make the argument that uh, increasing military spending is is more ethically dubious because it escalates the arms race. It makes the world more dangerous. On the other hand, if you felt confronting the Soviet Union, a country, uh, you know, state with an appalling human rights record, you think of the horrors of the purges, then taking a, mo a more robust approach to that um, could be seen as more ethical, more moral. So most political issues have an ambiguous morality, but I think the one uh, one political issue that where there certainly is an unambiguous transcendent morality is race. You know, do you believe people are equal or not? Um, and, you know, I go back to someone I have worked on a lot, which is John Kennedy. And in June 1963, June the 11th, 1963, he gave, I think, the greatest speech of his presidency, not the inauguration, but his speech on civil rights, in, for the first time, in which, for the first time in the 20th century, a president defined um, uh, civil rights as a moral issue. He said in the speech to the American people, this isn't just a legal issue, this isn't just a political issue, it's a moral issue. Do you believe that people are equal or not? So, uh, equal or not? So he, he provided the nation with moral leadership uh, and Trump hasn't. Um, indeed, he's inflamed uh, you know, racial tensions in America, no question about it. I think that's one way in which his presidency has been different from other modern presidents and, and uh, reprehensible as well. He's also been different in the sense that previous presidents have been internationalist, where um, there have been internationalist elements to his foreign policy, whatever you think about it, engaging with Russia and, and Vladimir Putin, at times negotiating with North Korea. But he also, in his inauguration, said this is going to be a new era, it's going to be America first, which was language directly from the lexicon, uh, from the isolationist lexicon of the 1930s. And so he, he talked about, as you know, building a wall to curb illegal immigration from Mexico. He um, banned immigration, tried to ban immigration from various Muslim countries right at the start of his presidency. Um, he withdrew, he, he's uh, withdrawn uh, America uh, from the Paris Environmental uh, Climate Change Accords. Um, and, and so on. So that 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 has been different, uh, different um, as well. But I think one of the biggest differences. Again, just keeping out of time here. One of the biggest differences has been a sort of rhetoric and sensibility of uh, nastiness. Uh, but I think that is unlike any other president. I mean, we know that Nixon could be, and certainly behind closed doors, could be malicious. And he's not the only uh, president to have been so. 
but in terms of the way in which he comported, has comported himself in public, and Trump has been at times just uh, nasty. Um, and you can see it in a lot of the tweets, um, the way in which he disparages people. And that, I mean, I'll maybe come back to this in the third section of the talk when I just talk for about 10 minutes about the 2020 election. But I think he's paid a big price for that because what he has politically is a solid base. I mean, it's about 40% of Americans that will support him, whatever. Um, and the polling data shows that to be the case. However, he, he, he is the, unlike any other modern president in terms of recorded polling data, he is the only one never to reach an approval rating of 50%. There's never been a moment, not a single moment during his presidency, even when the economy seemed to be you know, doing well pre-COVID and the stock market was booming, there was never a moment when, when half of Americans thought he was doing a good job. And I think that's because of the, the kind of nastiness that has alienated, I um, mean, maybe I'll come back to the sub suburban middle-class voters, certainly uh, women voters, um, young professionals. And if you compare them to Reagan or Eisenhower, um, who had, you know, in different ways, conservative philosophies and policies, and they managed to build a consensus in the country for their brand of conservatism, but probably 60% of Americans uh, thought they were, you know, uh, or more thought they were doing a, a good job. Reagan, remember, one and two landslides, as did Eisenhower. And uh, this is my kind of theory on this, and I've thought about this quite a lot, but I've got this theory, which is that I think there tends to be two types of candidates who are successful in American politics, sort of macho Democrats and avuncular Conservatives. And that's because for Democrats, the easiest uh, charge for opponents to make is that they are soft. In the Cold War context, they are soft on communism, they're soft on crime. Uh, conservatives would say, yes, say soft on, on, on welfare cheats and so on. So Democrats who have a kind of macho persona, that's very useful in, in combating that charge. So think about some of the Democrats who've been really successful, Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, um, Bill Clinton, they have that kind of macho persona. Um, and some of the Democrats have been unsuccessful, like Michael Dukakis or Adlai Stevenson, the opposite. With conservatives, the point of political vulnerability, the, the, the weak point, uh, is that they're callous. They don't care. They don't care about people who are poor um, and, and so on. And so uh, they're nasty. And um, so having a kind of warm, pleasant, congenial, avuncular personality is very, very useful in undercutting that charge. Eisenhower had it and Reagan had it. I mean, Reagan was just a really nice bloke. I mean, I think Mario Cuomo, the governor of New York, said he was impossible to dislike. That was a real asset. And it was hard to make those charges stick, that he was insensitive and callous. Uh, and, but Trump ha Trump's has the opposite. All of his personality traits reinforce those uh, negative stereotypes about him. Um, so I, I, so I, think, I think his persona is really important in explaining why, in terms of his approval ratings, they've never been very high. Uh, so his, the, the extent of his expressed nastiness and sort of malevolence is, is, is unprecedented, and I think he's paid a political price, price for that. Let me just talk briefly about the, um, the election itself, uh, where we are now, and what factors may determine it. And I want to start with the economy, because obviously the, the COVID crisis has had profound economic consequences. Uh, the economy was growing, the stock market was booming, um, Obviously, the COVID crisis with uh, lockdowns involved, uh, yeah, millions of Americans have, uh, have, have lost their jobs, uh, and there was an, ec there was an economic crisis. Um, I do think it's likely there would have been an economic downturn at some point anyway. I mean, even when he became president, um, historically, America was on a very long period of economic growth, and for there not to have been a crash sometime during Trump's first term, would have been totally unprecedented in American economic history. But anyway, the, the, there was an economic crisis. So what might the consequences of this be? I think if you look at American history over the last century, there is a very clear pattern if you think about it, which is every time, there was a, almost every time there was a major economic downturn, there was a change in party in the White House. 
1920, there's a recession, the Democrats lose the, the White House, the Republicans take over. 32, the Great Depression, the Republicans lose the White House, the Democrats take over. Even 60, when Kennedy won, people often forget there was a recession that year, the Republicans lose the White House. 1980, Democrats in the White House with Jimmy Carter, the, uh, all the econo economic indicators were bad, unemployment, uh, high, high, high interest rates, inflation, the Republicans, uh, Reagan win the presidency. Early 90s, a severe economic recession, uh, the Republicans lose the presidency, Bill Clinton takes over. Then 2008, with the financial crash, the Great Recession, uh, Barack Obama and the Democrats win the presidency. From the, so, every time, so almost every time there's a change in party in the White House, it seems to be connected to an economic crisis, downturn, and the way Americans respond to it. On the other hand, every time the economy is doing well, or at least the perception is the economy is doing better, uh, Roosevelt in 36, four years into his presidency, Eisenhower in 56, Reagan 84, Clinton 96, Obama 2012, presidents tend to be re-elected. So that doesn't bode well for Trump. Um, on the other hand, the argument he could make was, uh, it was he, what he could say is, look, it was clear my stewardship, stewardship of the economy was manifestly affected, the economy was growing, stock market was booming, and it was only because of this extraordinary uh, public health crisis that wasn't my responsibility, it wasn't my fault. Uh, that's, um, that's, why, that's why this has happened. Um, what is interesting about the polling data, and uh, I mean, it's been a really terrible month for him in the last couple of weeks, um, is still more Americans trust him on the economy than Biden. Um, so that, one definitely has to think about that. How will the state of the economy affect the out outcome of the election? Specifically, will the fact there is an economic crisis um, massively damage Trump's chances of, of, uh, of, of re-election. Okay, maybe five minutes. Um, so there's that. What other factors might determine the outcome of the election? Well, what about the COVID crisis? We are in the midst in 2020 of an extraordinary crisis. Um, I think most people would have said Trump could certainly have handled it better. There could have been uh, an earlier lockdown. He doesn't seem to have taken the seriousness of the crisis it was, he hasn't taken the crisis as seriously as he should have done. And also what's happened in the last few weeks has really damaged him in terms of his reputation uh, as someone able to, uh, his reputation as a crisis manager in dealing with this particular situation. Namely, if he can't even prevent uh, COVID from escalating in the White House, how can he prevent it from doing so in the country? I think that's what you know, a number of Americans now feel. So I was, just, I was just trying to think of anything analogous in terms of of crisis in the midst of a presidential campaign. And the one that came to mind actually was Jimmy Carter in the final year or so of his presidency in 1980. So Carter running against uh, Ronald Reagan. And people forget, if you look at the polls, uh, the polling data at the start of that political season, Carter was ahead. A lot of uh, people viewed Reagan as just outside the mainstream of American politics, uh, as an extremist, as someone who might start a nuclear war and so on. And Carter was ahead uh, in terms of the poll. In terms of the polls but in the final year or so Carter had to deal with two huge international crises one was the Iranian hostages crisis when American hostages were seized in uh, Tehran and the second was the Soviet invasion of, of Afghanistan which was seen as the Soviets on the front foot in the Cold War and the perception was that he didn't handle those crises particularly well particularly the Iranian hostages crisis and that definitely undermined his authority damaged his re-election campaign I think he would have lost anyway because of the state of the, uh, the state of the economy. But I, I guess the, the sort of simple rule there is, if you handle, I mean, I guess it's obvious, but worth articulating that if there's a major crisis during the presidential campaign and you're seen to handle it badly, that's got to damage your election prospects. The, um, the other negative uh, for Trump, and I think I touched on this earlier, is um, the way in which certain groups, which either supported him or to some extent supported him in 2016, have moved away uh, women. I mean, there is a huge gap now uh, amongst, uh, uh, between Trump and Biden in terms of women voters. I mean, this gender gap's existed for some time. If you look at Bill Clinton's, uh, Bill Clinton's election as president, a lot more women voted for him from, than men. But, for, but with Trump, there was a huge gender divide now between those who support Biden and those who support Trump. It seems like a lot of women uh, have just been repelled by, by what I was talking about early, uh, the, the kind of uh, you know, the nastiness, the malevolence, 
in terms of you know the rhetoric and and uh, and so on and you know, other factors uh, as well and so you know if you with the last election what was crucial were those uh, swing states you know florida pennsylvania michigan wisconsin the sort of rust belt old industrial states but because, actually if you look at the, but if you look if you look at, if you look at the polling data um, if you look at the um, uh, polling data there are now a whole group of states which you think of as traditionally conservative georgia texas iowa north carolina which are in play i mean biden could win um and that that is partly because women, women voters as i say uh, have turned against trump older voters have turned against trump actually very old voters still support trump in um in significant numbers but older voters over 65 generally have also turned against Trump as well. And also the nature of the South, the Sun Belt has changed. If you think of America from Florida going through the South towards California, that's changed. One of the salient facts of American politics in the last half century, which kind of explains a lot, is how the South changed. The South went from being solidly democratic to, from the 1960s onwards, um, uh, solidly Republican. It's basically been solidly Republican. It, might, it may well be the case now that it's changing back because of demographics. Uh, a lot of people have moved into southern uh, cities who are highly educated, uh, minorities, uh, people going to, into uh, suburban areas. The, the demographics have changed, and a lot of them don't don't like Trump's rhetoric. So, it's and that's not just to, to do with to do with Trump, but basically, um, area, states that he would won in 2016, Biden has a chance. I mean, I think Trump will still end up winning a number of those states or many of those states. In terms of the swing states, which had a crucial uh, uh, impact on the on the election in uh, 2016, I just looked at the polling data before uh, uh, I was going to say came on air before I before um, I came on Zoom, and uh, if you look at those crucial swing states, Rust Belt swing swing states, he's behind in Michigan and Wisconsin, also Pennsylvania. He's behind by quite a lot now, six or seven points if it was two three four points that's within the margin of that six so it's hard to see him winning those states so it seems like a number of the states which he needed to win in 2016 he's not going to win um states like florida are much closer so it's very difficult to say uh, to see a path to, to victory but on the other hand people said this four years ago and is it a case that again that there are a lot of people or a significant number of people who vote for trump uh who aren't articulating that in the polls that are going on um, that seems to have happened last time. Also, I mean, Biden is a very experienced politician. He was a consequential vice president. He's one of the youngest ever elected senators, but still maybe not the strongest Democratic candidate. Uh, I think if this was JFK or probably if it was Bill Clinton, uh, this campaign would be over. But Biden uh, is not as strong, uh, and of course Barack Obama too, is, is not the, the strongest candidate. So um, the... The, in terms of the polling average, I've looked at the recent polls and there's a little bit of difference, but they're actually very consistent at the moment that Trump is nine to 10 percentage points behind Biden, which is a huge margin. So there is the, I'd say this, there is the possibility that there could be a landslide. It could be like when Reagan beat Carter in 80, for example, that could happen. Um, but Trump could win. So there was a chance that Trump could win as he did in 2016. but the only way he could do that is by uh, everything falling into place. All the, you know, the, the states that are sort of toss-ups, he needs to win. Um, there probably needs to be a surge towards him in the last couple of weeks of the campaign. Um, so according to the polling data, the over is Trump does have a chance, but the overwhelming likelihood is a Biden victory and a Biden comprehensive victory uh, could, could, could happen. Um, so let's see it's now oh it's i've been talking for about 50 minutes um so i think i should stop there and i'll just check if any question i think a question did come in so i will just see if i can um oh i think one question has come in uh oh i can't see it um shall i read it to you yes please stephen <clears throat> do you think if biden wins that there will be civil unrest and will Trump challenge the result in the courts? Um, well, 
he he has you know f he does have fervent support amongst his base um so there's nothing to no, nothing to to say that, that that isn't a possibility in terms of um that sort of civil unrest you know obviously i hope not i do think what is going to happen if he loses even if he doesn't lose even if he lose, loses uh not by a landslide i think republicans will start abandoning him i think uh i think quite a few republicans now are concerned about the long-term damage he's done to the party so maybe that will reduce the chances of there being that kind of uh, res uh response in terms of him charge challenging in the courts um he is notoriously litigious uh i mean famously famously in 1973 when he was a sort of property magnate the u.s federal government sued him uh for based for racial discrimination in the renting out of his apartments um in his in his properties and uh he he countersued the government uh, uh, for uh, discrimination against himself and for defamation. So he's very litigious. So, um, yeah, it's possible. I don't know if any of that. You have a question from, from Jenny Stevens. If Trump loses but refuses to accept the result, what's the constitutional position in terms of getting shot of him? <laughs> You mean if he if he physically doesn't leave the White House? Yeah. Um, I I I I'd be very Best surprised. Marines. Yes. yes. Um, I mean, I think what would happen in that, I think it'd be I think it'd be, it'd be like Watergate, you know, where Republicans and senators went into Nixon and just said, "Look, it's over. You know, we we, we can't back you anymore. It's over, and you, and, uh, you need to, you need to resign." I think something similar would happen with Trump, where the Republican Party. Uh, leaders, establishment w would would disown him or t and tell him he needs to go. Um, so if he if he loses the election, he's constitutionally required to 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 leave the, to leave the office. Um, if he if he if he if he physically doesn't do so, uh, I I suppose uh, Congress would, would would need to make arrangements to make sure that happens. But I think I think if he loses in a, in a landslide, that's not going to arise. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question, they can either type it and I'll read it, or you can put, if you know how to do it, put your hand up and I can let you speak, um, whichever is more convenient. I can see them now. I can see the Yeah. Um, and, um, okay, well, we've got uh, another one, which is uh, parallels between Johnson, that's Boris, not, a, <laughs> not the other Johnson, uh, and Trump in terms of what the COVID crisis has done to their standing. Interesting. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I think, well, it's definitely, it's definitely damaged both, hasn't it? It's definitely damaged both. Uh, Trump before the COVID crisis could claim a booming economy, uh, definitely had a, a substantially greater chance of being reelected than he does now. Uh, COVID has called into question his leadership skills and also damaged his record on the economy. And with Johnson, it's definitely the same. Um, I mean, I saw this, did you see it? This in remarkable statistic, which said that because of his handling of COVID, something like 30% of conservative MPs or conser conservative party members, maybe 30% of, uh, you know, only 30% want want uh, Johnson to stay and they wouldn't they wouldn't mind if there was a change in leadership. I mean Johnson did win the biggest Tory majority in over 30 years, the biggest since Thatcher in 87. Um, and was was in it politically, was in a very strong position then. And this has definitely damaged him in that sense. And also, I mean he did have a very interesting agenda, which was to invest in the North, uh, to appeal to um, all those red wall, red wall northern constituencies, and he doesn't, he isn't really able to pursue that agenda anymore. So it's it's diverted him from his campaign commitments. It's damaged his credibility. Uh, obviously, we've got a, a, an economic crisis here as well. So it's damaged Johnson, and it's damaged Trump in the same way. I think the damage for Trump is greater because Trump's 
handling of it has been more egregious. Uh, Johnson's definitely made major mistakes. Um, track and trace system seems to be handled very badly. On, on the other hand, the NHS was protected. My understanding is that the uh, major progress has been made on, on uh, in terms of the vaccine programme. So I think it's, in short, it's damaged both of them, but I think it's damaged Trump more. I think I saw a question from Adriana um, on the, on the Q&A here which is, hi Adriana, uh, it says, could you share your views on the impact, I think maybe I've done, done this, on the impact of Trump's policies and science development and public health, given his inadequate and very criticized response to the COVID pandemic? Um, well, I mean, I think his, uh, I can just add to what I've already said, which I think tr Trump's hand handled it very, uh, you know, very, very badly. He, he seems to be uh, ignorant of sort of basic, basic science. Some of his, some of his ideas have been uh, eccentric. I mean, I mentioned his suggestion that Americans consider using uh, uh, dis dis disinfectant. He seems to have just simply underestimated the seriousness of the situation. And, I, and my reading is it was wishful thinking. He basically wanted the COVID crisis to go away. He wanted to ease the lockdown as soon as possible. He wanted to get the economy going as soon as possible uh, on the basis that, that that would assist him in his re-election. Re so, um, Adriana, you may well know more than, than I do in terms of what's happening in, in terms of the, uh, the, the research and scientific programmes that are going on in the, in the States. But yeah, I think he's handled it, handled, handled it very badly. Um. We had a question from Mary, but she seems to have disappeared since asking it. So any, anybody else wants to raise their hand? Ah, yes, you're there. I'll let you, oh, you're gone. Where, where are you? You keep disappearing. <laughs> Hang on. I'm just, I'm gonna try and, I'm trying to get you to, uh, Diane, I'm gonna let you speak. Diane? Hello? Hello, hello. Thank you so much. It was a really interesting talk and, and, so nice to have it just be intellectually based, not emotional. You know, as an American, I am so burnt out from emotional responses to politics there. Um, so I was thinking, given that Biden takes the election, you know, I too want it more fervently than anything else in my memory. Um, who, how do you see the Republican Party regrouping and reorganizing and who do you think they might turn to for leadership within their department, within their party? It's a really good question. Um, well, uh, you know, in terms of who will be the next Republican Party leader, in terms of who will be the next presidential candidate, that's very difficult to say. I mean, there is a tradition now of vice presidents um, staking a leadership claim. So I presume Mike Pence will try to do that. I do agree with you, I think what you're suggesting, which is that the Republican Party really do need to sit back and think conceptually about how they need to change. Because I think it's, I think it's analogous to the Democrats in the early 90s or in the late 80s, which is um, after 1988, the Democrats had lost five out of six presidential elections in a row. And so how, should, how would they to change that? So Democrats set up this group, the DLC, the Democrat Leadership Council, which considered those questions. Bill Clinton was a big part of that. And, um, you know, Bill Clinton made the argument, we've got to appeal to the, to the middle class uh, we, uh, as well. Um, and, you know, why should, why should the Democratic Party be soft on crime? What, what is the virtue, uh, virtue in, uh, in that? Um, so when he ran for president in 1992, he called for 100,000 more police officers in the streets. And it had an effect when he was ran for re-election in 96. More, um, more of the American people had faith in Clinton, Bill Clinton, on law and order issues than, than, they, uh, than they did with Bob Dole. And for the Republicans now, I mean, it's this really interesting statistic, isn't it? Which is only, let me think about this, only once in the last 30 years, um, only once in the last 30 years, is this right? <laughs> yes, only once in the last 30 years have the Republicans won a majority of votes in a presidential election, which is 2004. Bill Clinton won 92, Bill Clinton won 96. 
George Bush Jr. won in 2000 over Al Gore, but got less votes. Most votes in 2004, Obama 2008, Obama 2012. Um, 2016, Trump got 3 million less votes than Hillary Clinton. So only once in 30 years have the Republicans actually got a majority of the votes. So there's an underlying long-term problem for them. And as I was saying earlier, I think a massive issue for them is how the South is changing. And the South is probably going to shift from being solidly Republican. Um, you know, you, uh, you have uh, people from minority backgrounds, um, I was saying this earlier, um, a highly educated young people moving into <laughs> Southern cities and the demographics changing. So they need to, the kind of racialized politics that, that Trump's embraced, I, they, they, you know, which is reprehensible anyway, but it's something that, that they really need to move uh, away from and uh, need to articulate some a more kind of inclusive message that's going to appeal to a wider electorate. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure who... I, I don't have any obvious candidate in mind for someone who, who could lead that kind of intellectual and political process, but as you're suggesting, they need to do it. Thank you. Um, Mary... Hello, Mary. Mary? Oh. Can you hear me? Ah, what's happening here? I can. S um, sorry. Uh, yeah. She's not unmuting. No, it's not unmuting for some reason. Let me try again. Don't seem to be able to. <laughs> Hang on. That's really annoying. Could I chat? No, no, it's not right. Ah, right now, Mary. It's Nigel. Nigel, okay, Nigel. It comes up as uh, The one person Hi, you haven't mentioned, Mark, good evening, is Kamala Harris. Mm. Now, she has not been long in the limelight uh, in this part of mm. Europe. Um, nor probably the whole world, but she seems to have made a huge impression in a very short time. Whereas Mike Pence, I don't think anyone really understands or knows much about. What is the American feeling? And yeah, uh, thanks Nigel, good, uh, good question. Um, so, I mean, um, Kamala Harris has, you know, I think generally has a, a strong reputation uh, I was looking at her questioning of the Donald Trump Supreme Court nominee, and I thought yes. um, very rigorous. Uh, that, I mean, people I, you know, just people I speak to, um, there's a lot of talk about how she may well be the next president. In that, I, I don't know if you saw the first debate, but um, with Biden, I think in American politics, it's not a question of whether you whether you're you know an older person; it's whether you seem old. So Reagan was the, uh, I think I'm right in saying the oldest ever elected president when he was elected in 1980, but he didn't seem old. Um, but Biden in the debate to me, um, he's visibly um, changed in the last five years. The voice is weaker. He, he, he seems uh, to struggling to, to recall things in, in, in his answers. So uh, there is a feeling that, he, that the idea is he serves one term and then Kamala, Kamala Harris will be, will be the candidate in four years' time. But, I've, I've, you know, I think there's even the possibility that Biden, I don't know, it's just speculative and it's hypothetical, but I think there is the chance that um, he goes just a couple of years. Of course, it was 78, right? So he, to, to go past the, the uh, off-term elections in two years' time, he'll be in his 80s. So maybe he'll just go a couple of years, two or three years. Um, uh, so I think she it's quite likely that she will play a significant role in American political the American political history that's to unfold in the next few years. Mike Pence is someone who's uh, often criticised for having, um, you know, just very very conservative views. Uh, in the debate, he came across. I mean, I guess it's in contrast to Trump, but he came across as what measured, calm, uh, answered questions pretty well. Uh, I, I've read conservative comedy as a made that point that he actually came across well. Um, so, yeah, 
we'll see. We'll see. I mean, if Biden did, if he does win, and if he does run for re-election, because um, so that would take him to 86, 87, wouldn't it? Um, but yeah, she seems a substantial politician uh, and, uh, let's say, could well play an important role in the next few years. Thank you, Thank you Nigel. Let's see if there's any more. No, I think that's more or less it. Mark, we've, um, for those of you who um, might have missed part of it, we're hoping to record it and we'll put it on the website um, so you can have a look at it. Uh, it only remains for me, as they say, to thank Mark again. Although I think, I think within what you said, there's germs of another talk about America at some point. But let's leave it for a while. And uh, thank you very much indeed for, for, for giving us the talk, which was, as always, well delivered and interesting. And thank you so much. And uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, Stephen. Again. Oh, well, I really enjoyed a lot of people saying thank you and excellent and so forth in, in notes. So that's good. Oh, so that's, that, uh... that's, I'm afraid there's no applause now. So. <laughs> <laughs> So you'll just be in us, but you'll, you'll have lots of written applause, I guess. Thank you again, and uh, good night. Thanks, Stephen. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for attending. Bye. Bye.